Mm -hmm. Just happened. Settle in. Says you're live on Facebook. All right, we are live on Facebook. Hi, everyone on Facebook. And hello, everyone on Zoom. Thank you for joining us today. And I'm just going to try to find my screen that has Zoom real quick. I do not see it. Do, do, do. Where did we go here? Um, all right. We are live. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Climate Change, a scientist and a lawyer walk into a webinar. My name is Alice Christman, and I am the Senior Manager of Marketing and Community Engagement at the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. And we are here to find out what happens when we get a scientist and a lawyer to walk into a webinar to talk about client change. In a recent blog post on the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, we reported that sea levels on the Chesapeake Bay are rising at some of the fastest in the nation. In Norfolk, Virginia alone, they're nearly a foot higher than they were in 1960. Today, we'll be hearing from two speakers about the science and legal perspectives. During this program, we will also be taking questions. You can ask them in the Zoom chat for those participating on Zoom, or you can ask them in the Facebook comments below. We'll collect your questions and we'll ask them at the end of the program with the help of my faithful assistant, Ashley Anwalt. To kick off our program today, we will be hearing from Beth McGee. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen here so she can go ahead and start sharing hers. We're gonna be hearing from Beth McGee. Beth McGee, she is the Director of Science and agricultural policy at the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. She earned her undergraduate degree at the University of Virginia and then went on to postgraduate work at the University of Delaware and completed a PhD in estuary and science at the University of Maryland. Beth McGee, you are now welcome to walk into our webinar. Thank you for joining us. Great, thanks, Alice. I'm gonna jump right in here with the science part. Um, I wanted to start out just with a little climate change 101 to make sure everybody's on the same page in terms of our understanding, basic understanding of climate change. So you can see the schematic here and I, maybe you can see my arrow. So the sun heats up the earth. Some of that heat and energy is, is bounced back into the atmosphere. Some is, is absorbed by the earth. Some of what's absor are absorbed by the earth goes back into the atmosphere, but some of it bounces off of um, the atmosphere. That's what keeps us warm. That's a normal process. Uh, the issue is that greenhouse gases uh, increase the amount of heat that is retained by the earth. So we know that the, the climate is changing uh, because of more greenhouse gases and this, this warming effect. Uh, some of the main greenhouse gases, the, the prim primary one is carbon dioxide. So that's formed when you combust things like coal, natural gas, uh, oil as the number one, but there are other ones that we're concerned about. Nitrous oxide, which is the chemical formula is N2O, uh, that, for example, is formed when you apply nitrogen to agricultural fields or to your lawn. A little bit is off-gassed um, by microbial processes into the atmosphere, um, and that's a really potent greenhouse gas, in fact, much more potent in terms of its greenhouse gas effects than, than carbon dioxide. And then methane is another uh, very common one. That's cows burping produce methane. Uh, methane is also released when we're extracting natural gas. I've also shown um, where the sources of greenhouse gases are coming from in the U.S. And I think this will uh, definitely relate to when Brittany starts talking about our focus on the regulatory context. You'll see the link there between transportation, energy, et cetera, in terms of uh, our focus from the regulatory perspective. So the globe is getting warmer. Our water is getting warmer in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, this uh, on the I guess, left hand of the screen our data from the Virginia Institute of Marine Science in Virginia and the Chesapeake Biological Lab who have been monitoring water outside their labs in the Chesapeake Bay for decades. And you can see the increase in terms of temperature, water temperature has been increasing um, since, uh, since they've been keeping track basically. So reflecting the globe is warming, water is warming. Uh, but we're also seeing that in our streams. And you'll see in the other graph that these are monitoring stations in streams throughout the Chesapeake Bay. Red indicates stations that have increased temperature, water temperature over the time. And you can see we are seeing across the board, not, not in every case, but in most cases, increasing in our uh, temperatures in our streams, especially in the Southern parts of the Bay region. So what does that mean for our ecological resources? Well, 
one major impact is that all things being equal, warm water holds less oxygen. Animals that live in the bay need oxygen to live. So all things being equal, if we have warmer water, there's gonna be less oxygen in for aquatic animals. So that's gonna be stressful to them. Um, what we see very commonly in the Chesapeake Bay in the summertime is that we have, again, very warm water at the surface of the, the bay. At the bottom of the bay, the dead zone, because it's getting warmer, dead zone is the area with no oxygen, it's expanding and so, fish like rockfish sort of get trapped in that zone between really warm water that they don't want to be in at the surface and no oxygen water at the bottom of the bay. And they get trapped in that area. They're crowded. They're stressed. Uh, if anybody went fishing on the bay last year, there was huge um, mortality from fish being caught uh, and released with all good intentions, but the fish are stressed and they just can't handle that warm water. And so they're, they end up dying. We lost a lot of them, I think, just from the bycatch of uh, commercial and recreational fishing last year. And that's an, um, an other impact of, of warmer waters is we're, we're seeing species die off. This is showing you um, information for eelgrass. Eelgrass is a common species uh, of underwater grass in the Virginia, mostly saltier parts of the bay, very important habitat, especially for crabs. This is showing you uh, aerial view of an eelgrass bed in 2005, which was one of the warmest summers we've had on record in the Bay. 2011 was a re another really hot year. And in both of those years, we saw a major die off of eelgrass. You'll see the, the dark area on the screen here is uh, underwater grass bed in June, and then it's completely gone in December. So eelgrass is a species that is at the southern end. It's a northern species at the southern end of its distribution, so it really doesn't like warm water. And one of the fears of scientists is that we actually could lose eelgrass from the Chesapeake Bay because our, we're continuing to have warmer, hotter summers. Another species, bay species, not in the bay, but actually upstream, for example, in Pennsylvania are brook trout. They trout of most species, but brook trout in particular like cold water, they need cold water. So as our streams are warming, we're constraining that brook trout habitat. Um, and so they're not happy either in one of the species that we'll um, perhaps see less of moving forward. Alice mentioned this in the intro, we are very susceptible in this region to sea level rise. Sea level rise is being caused by the fact that we're losing glaciers and uh, 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 other parts of our northern in the Antarctic and uh, Arctic regions are melting and so they're adding more volume to the to the sea and that is causing seas to rise. But in this region we have a double whammy. We actually have land subsidence that is occurring. It's occurring about the same rate as sea level rise. So our quote apparent sea level rise is two to three times the global average. This is showing you for the last century in millimeters um, how much uh, the seas have risen in several places throughout the East Coast. Uh, the first few are in Virginia, and you'll see they are two to three times the global average, which is about 1.75 millimeters or about a half a century a year. We're two to three times that um, in terms of our, our uh, susceptibility to sea level rise. So we're very vulnerable here in the Bay region. Um, and what does that mean? It means we're losing habitat. We're losing wetlands, we're losing islands. If you've spent any time around the bay, you have seen that with your own eyes, uh, more flooding and, and loss and erosion of habitat and critical ecological features like our, our wetlands. So how much worse will it get? Well, that depends on us, frankly, and, and what we do both, both in the US and globally. This is showing you information from a study that came out, excuse me, in 2018 by, led by Don Bosch, who's a preeminent scientist from the University of Maryland, recently retired, but still very active in the scientific space. Uh, and he updated uh, projections of sea level rise for this region. And this is a, a graph from that report. And it's showing you in the future how we expect the seas to rise, depending on what actions we take to reduce greenhouse gases. So you can see by 2050, which frankly isn't that far away, we're looking at on average about a one and a half uh, foot increase in sea level rise. But as we project further into the future, what we do really impacts um, how much more sea level rise we will experience. So, so uh, sort of business as usual would be growing emissions. That doesn't look good for us. By, by 2100, seas could rise more than um, five feet. Uh, if we follow the Paris Agreement, which caused called for global reductions in greenhouse gases, we end up on this blue line. And then if we're sort of stabilized where we are, we end up somewhere on this, uh, this green line. So kind of the median. But again, we have we have a we can control some of what happens and our future will be dictated by what we do now. 
So there's lots of interesting tools online that you can look to, to project, well, hey, if where I live, what will happen under various sea level rise projections. Uh, this is showing you a two foot rise, which is sort of the median by 2100, two feet is you know, maybe on the low end of, of what we might experience here in the Chesapeake Bay. And this is showing you what happens at Tangier Island. Um, you can see this is the firehouse at Tangier Island. And this isn't a storm event. This is just sort of business as usual, um, what, what we will see. And you can, you can see that that's not good news for Tangier. They already have lost a lot of their, um, their land there. Another issue that local coastal communities are facing now is this notion of what they call nuisance flooding or chronic inundation where it doesn't take a storm to cause flood conditions. In fact, we may be actually seeing some of that uh, around here today, given the way the winds are blowing, but it's the, the amount of flood days that are occurring in a particular community over time, sort of this, you know, again, not tied to a storm, just sort of business as usual. This is showing you information for a station that is right near uh, Norfolk, Virginia, which is experiencing a, a lot of issues associated with flooding. And you can see over time how much more, how many more flood days they are getting in that region. And under the sort of the median case scenario of sea level rise, uh, by 2050, this number will increase to about 100 flood days per year. So about 100 days on average where they're going to have this flooding of, of areas uh, that really are is affecting that low-lying community as well as many others throughout the Chesapeake Bay. Sort of the last big impact of, of climate change are that we, and we already are experiencing more intense storms and more frequency of these intense storms. And a classic example of that is what we saw in July of 2018. This is showing you precipitation levels that occurred during that month in that year. And the dark green are areas that experienced record wet, wetness during that time. So you can see that's the Susquehanna River Basin right there feeding into the, Jay, had, into the bay. We had record levels of precipitation. From the ecological perspective, I mean, flooding is a bad thing, certainly from human health and, and public risk. But from the ecological perspective, more flooding, more rain means more pollution coming into the bay. There have been some estimates of, given the three impacts of climate change, warmer waters, uh, sea level rise, and more intense storms bringing more pollution, that by 2025, we will have to, in order to compensate for that effect on the bay, dissolved oxygen in particular, we will need to reduce nitrogen by an additional 5 million pounds. So in other words, because of these climate change impacts affecting dissolved oxygen, we need to do more than we already think we need to do uh, just to put that into context, um, right now we're looking at a gap of about 50 million pounds that we need to close between now and 2025. We've just made that um, 55 million pounds because of climate change. Uh, some of the other impacts that are related to a lot of precipitation, a lot of fresh water is changing salinity regimes. One thing we saw in 2018 was that we saw a lot of oyster mortality. Oysters can tolerate a little bit of fresh water, but not much and not over extended period of times. And so in areas that experienced, like in the Potomac River, upper parts of the bay, saw oyster reefs pretty much wiped out because of this uh, fresh water influx that came in and, and pretty much stayed there. We also have seen the redistribution of species. I know that I fish, I live in uh, Southern Anne Arundel County, County on the bay. At our fishing pier, people are catching a lot of blue catfish this year. Blue catfish typically are in fresher waters, but when you get um, fresh waters coming in to all these rivers, uh, you, they are able to go out of the rivers and, and spread throughout the, um, throughout the bay. So we're seeing uh, basically uh, fish being sort of redistributed um, in places where they haven't previously been. So that's all pretty depressing, but I always like to end on a note of optimism. And, and the note of optimism here is that many of the things that we do for water quality are also good for climate change. Uh, agricultural practices is a great example of that. We're doing things like forested buffer, no-till farming, grass buffers uh, for a lot of reasons, but one of which is to improve water quality. But these also will sequester carbon. So they're gonna pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So it's helping both mitigate climate change as well as improve water quality. Another great example of that are, are air regulations. We've, we've seen a lot of benefits in terms of nitrogen reductions because of, of air regulations regarding cars and power plants. And again, there's a dual benefit there in terms of greenhouse gases. And I think um, Brittany is gonna talk a little bit more about our work in that space. Thanks. All right. 
Beth, thank you. I actually have some questions for you, but I'm gonna I'm gonna hold off until the end because I'm a very good moderator. Thank you, mm -hmm. thank you. That was Beth, the scientist, and I know that if we were in like a live audience, there'd be a lot of like, yay! So I'm gonna be I'm I'm also the moderator and the live applause. Uh, with that being said, I'm really excited to be welcoming our lawyer into the webinar, the fabulous Brittany Wright. Uh, Brittany received her undergraduate degree from Hofstra. Hof Straff University, and then she went on to get her law degree from the Vermont Law School. And Brittany, you can go ahead and start sharing your screen. Uh, before joining us at the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, she actually worked as a fellow at Oceana, and then she came on board to the Chesapeake Bay Foundation as a fellow. And I like to think she was kind of on like the three hour tour. She thought she was only going to stay for a year, and we've got her. We snagged her for a couple more years. So we're really excited. And um, I'm excited to introduce to you guys Brittany Wright to talk about, and she is our lawyer walking into the webinar. Great, thank you, Alice. I'm happy to be here and talk about how the litigation department is working to address um, climate change in the context of Clean Air Act regulation. So like Beth mentioned, uh, the energy sector and the transportation sector are the two largest sources of greenhouse gas emissions uh, nationally. And so we've been involved in um, two cases surrounding regulatory rollbacks, so that's a um, weakening of those emissions from, um, excuse me, weakening of those regulations from the, the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, so the first has to do with power plants, um, and to give a little bit of history, the um, Clean Power Plan was a regulation developed back in 2015 designed to limit emissions from uh, coal-fired power plants mostly, um, fossil fuel-fired power plants. And the way that this was going to be achieved would be through these three building blocks that states were then able to use to develop their state-level plans, um, really getting into the nitty-gritty of how states were going to meet these reduction requirements that were set at the federal level. Um, so those three building blocks, the first is to improve heat rate efficiency at power plants. And all that means is that for one kilowatt of electricity generated, you'd be using less fuel, so you'd be using less coal. Um, the second was to begin to start substituting electricity generation from coal with natural gas. Um, again, as Beth mentioned, natural gas does have um, methane emissions associated with it, but when it's burned, it re um, releases less carbon dioxide than coal. Um, so that was kind of the transitional building block. And then the third is to really shift towards renewable energy. So to begin to substitute electricity generation from coal and natural gas with zero emitting renewable energy sources like solar power, wind power, hydropower, you name it, anything renewable that has zero carbon dioxide emissions. Um, unfortunately, the Clean Power Plan was never uh, implemented due to a stay from the Supreme Court uh, during some underlying litigation. And then in June of 2019, the EPA fully repealed the Clean Power Plan and replaced it with the Affordable Clean Energy Rule. Um, and even though the name sounds great, this rule um, is affectionately referred to as the Dirty Energy Rule um, in the environmental community because it really is more of a lifeline for aging power plants. Um, so if you remember back from the previous slide, those three building blocks in the Clean Power Plan, the Affordable Clean Energy Rule only implemented the first one, which is heat rate improvements at individual power plants. Um, the regulation also failed to set a national limit for carbon dioxide emissions, meaning that as states developed these plans, they had no feeling that they had to bring their emissions underneath. Um, so the problem with that is that as uh, power plants are adding those efficiency measures and um, improving their efficiency, it's, um, they're becoming more competitive on the national grid. So it's costing less money for a power plant to operate. And that means that the power plant might be called on by the grid more frequently than say a fully natural gas facility or a solar energy facility, um, because the grid is gonna call them the cheapest source of electricity at any given moment. And so without that cap, and without that transition to renewable sources of energy, coal-fired power plants have now become, they've gotten their facelift. They can run for more hours in a day, they can run more frequently, and cumulatively lead to more emissions of greenhouse gases instead of less. Um, so CBF, um, along with a broad coalition of environmental and public health groups and states and power companies, 
have all sued the EPA for repealing the Clean Power Plan and replacing it with the Affordable Clean Energy Rule. Um, this case is ongoing right now. We're in the middle of what's called briefing, which is where the attorneys um, are writing their arguments in these really long documents and submitting it to the court, kind of outline why these rules should be overturned. Um, that's going to happen throughout the summer and hopefully have oral arguments sometime in the fall um, if all things move forward the way that they're, we're expecting them. So uh, keep looking out for some updates on this litigation. Um, the second big topic that we're addressing from the litigation perspective has to do with car emissions. So um, the EPA and the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration issued the Safer Affordable Fuel Efficient Vehicles Rule or the SAFE Rule. Um, so this again was kind of a two-part rule. Um, the first part, the EPA um, withdrew California's authority under the Clean Air Act to set stricter uh, standards for fuel efficiency and greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and it also prevents states from adopting zero emission vehicle mandates. So think electric cars. Um, this matters in the Bay watershed because a significant number of watershed states followed that California program. Um, Delaware, Maryland, New York, Pennsylvania, and DC were all following that stricter program. So now the entire country has to operate on the same regulation. And the second part of the safe rule, this part two rule that was finalized a few weeks ago, guts those standards. So um, the prior regulation required a tightening of fuel efficiency 5% annually for every model year car. So each new model year car had to be uh, more fuel efficient than the last. Uh, the new regulation only requires a 1.5% improvement in fuel efficiency. So that's a significant departure from the reductions that would have been seen under the prior regulation. Uh, so again, CBS has been working with our partners um, in the environmental and public health sphere and states as well to sue the EPA and the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration over the safe rule for the um, real rollback in reduction requirements from vehicles. And so I just wanted to kind of end this with a little bit of um, context and background and kind of the human perspective and tie into some of the work that we're doing in communities around these issues. So this is um, a map showing you, um, it's a tool from the uh, Environmental Protection Agency called EJ Screen, which is environmental justice screen. So on the right side, that is the demographic data of this area of Portsmouth and Norfolk. And so the red areas indicate that this is an area where minority populations live. The left side of your screen shows proximity to Superfund sites. And so those are hazardous waste sites that have been identified by the EPA for cleanup. So really red, there's a lot of Superfund sites in this region. Um, there's at least six um, that are listed on the EPA's list as targets for cleaning up. But um, there's a lot of legacy pollution from these facilities. It's in the air, it's in the water, it's in the soil. And these minority communities are already overburdened by that pollution. And so, um, even though climate change and these air regulations are so intimately tied and have such an impact on these frontline communities like Norfolk that's experiencing really fast rates of sea level rise, a lot of times that's not on people's um, priority lists. It's not on their radar because they are worried about the industrial site down the road from them that they know is harming them. Um, but climate change can sometimes be a little bit harder to see and a little bit harder to make that connection. And so um, that's part of part of why we do this, part of why we're engaged in these, these regulations, because we know that these communities are, are feeling these effects. But we um, are also working to develop stronger community relationships with our um, environmental justice staff attorney, Taylor Lilly, has been working in this community, as well as our great grassroots staff out of Hampton Roads. Um, to, to both do a needs assessment and understand what these communities are concerned about, but also to do education and help them understand the relationship between climate change, air pollution, um, and the impacts that they're seeing and the impacts that they're feeling. And, and the goal of all of this is to just develop um, well-educated, better advocates, give these uh, communities the tools that they need to be a part of the conversation and give them the space to be a part of the conversation. So that when we're talking about climate change and we're talking about adaptation measures like 
um, retreating from, from thinking uh, areas or we're talking about mitigation measures like reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So these communities are a full part of that conversation. And so um, that's it. We're happy to answer questions about these cases and, and our work in these communities and um, why we do what we do and why we care about these issues. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I think what you're what you really showed to us is how we are taking that science and taking it to the bigger level to think about reducing emissions, which is a huge part of doing our part to to combat climate change. Um, I'm going to go to my faithful assistant, Ashley Anawalt. We're going to shift to taking some questions. I know we have at least one question in the hopper. So, Ashley, how are we looking for questions from our audiences today? Hi, Alice. So. Frederick is asking what we're recording and learning so far about any of the changes we might be seeing um, just over the past month or so with the reduction of the human presence in the environment right now. Hmm. Uh, that's a great question. There, um, I think air quality improvements is what people are, are most documenting. That certainly happened in China when they sort of shut down, and we are seeing it here as well. If, if you look at um, ozone and, and air quality smog, that kind of thing, we're, we're seeing benefits. Uh, we also expect that uh, because about a third of the nitrogen coming into the bay comes from the air, uh, that we would be seeing less nitrogen. The unfortunate thing is that uh, it's gonna be a challenge for us to actually go back and look to see whether, for example, we were seeing less nitrogen loading because a lot of the monitoring is not happening. There is some going on, but because of COVID and concerns about uh, public safety, a lot of the monitoring that typically goes on this time of year and throughout the summer is not happening. So our ability to kind of document some of the benefits we may be seeing, but the fact that we're not driving and using as much electricity, um, we may or may not be able to, to look back and, and see. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Frederick. Other questions for us, Ashley? I have a couple, actually I actually have a question for you, Beth, about dead zones. Do, is there a certain season when we're gonna be seeing dead zones more often? I, I know I hear about them more in the summer. Right, yeah, sorry, I should have covered that. So uh, yes, dead zones typically start setting up depending on how warm it is. Again, because it, it is warm water, less oxygen, that definitely affects the dead zone now and will in the future. So typically start setting up in May and it occurs mostly in the deeper waters of the bay and then you'll see it uh, progressively increase through May, June, July, August, September, it starts to wane, usually is gone by October. So July and August are usually our worst months for the dead zone in terms of the, the volume of, of bay water that's affected by low oxygen or no oxygen. Awesome, cool. Any, any questions from the crowd, Ashley? Yeah, so uh, Joan was asking, uh, she said she's interested to see the cleaner air now and wondering how we can keep it up when we all get back to work. <laughs> <laughs> That's more like, no, stay home. Yeah, more, <laughs> I, I think um, one benefit that could come out of this is we realize that, that we can telework. I mean, not everyone can telework, certainly, but um, I, I think that that could be a realization uh, that comes out of this, that we do have less cars on the road um, you know, moving forward, but we'll see. Yeah, that's good. All right. Um, I have one more question, and then I and this is I'm going to go to Brittany for this one. And um, when you're talking, I believe this is a clean power plan, and you talked about the the groups that you are going moving into litigation with. Did you say you're working with a power company, with power companies within that? Yeah. So group? there's a, a coalition of um, power companies that um, have been working with the states and the environmental groups all along um, that do challenging over this rule too. So, I mean, there's there's aspects of the industry that realize that um, the shifts that the clean power plan would have had um, are happening. They need to continue to happen. And so um, they, they also challenge the repeal of the rule. There's also a coalition of, of industry that challenge the issuance of the regulation, meaning that they think even the affordable clean energy rule is too much of a regulation and they shouldn't be regulated. So the, um, the case is really on all sides, um, green groups, environmental groups, states saying that this is not doing enough. And then another kind of subset of energy, um, coal, mainly coal companies um, saying that this is too much, you've regulated us too much right now. So 
really full frontal attack. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> we're keeping you busy is what it sounds like. And I know we've got a good, a good attorney in you. So I'm happy to see that. We're actually going to transition to closing out our time today with my scientist and my my, my scientist and my, my attorney today, thank you so much for your great guidance on um, the science and the law of climate change. I know that we put some great links below for further follow-up and this, this, this um, webinar is being recorded so you can actually refer back to it as well. I'm gonna click us through some things you can do. You can drive, Beth wants you to stay home and drive less. It's okay, I'm just kidding. I'm not gonna talk Beth. I <laughs> Walk some more. Um, you know, we talked about just reducing our emissions and driving less is a part of that. Um, planting trees is also a great way to sequester carbon. I have a great way for you to plant some trees. We have a fantastic promotion going on right now with the Bay Foundation. And also remember to contact your elected officials. If you go to the Action Center at the Chesapeake Bay Foundation website, cbf.org, uh, there's some actions you can take today to support clean water. Today is your last day to um, get five native trees sent to your house for contributors um, that provide $50, you can receive native trees. We're sending, out, sending them out to addresses within the watershed to keep the trees within the watershed. And they'll be shipped within about two weeks. Today is your last day. I think it's a pretty cool Mother's Day gift. Why give her flowers when you can give her a forest? Am I right? Am I right? Yeah, I love it. This is hard not having an audience, but I think- You're right, Alice, you're right. <laughs> I always count on you, Beth. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I know that we're including the link in, in the comments below. Today is April 30th and the last day for this deal. And moving along, you, these are some other ways to support clean water. You can go to cbf.org backslash give. Check, out, check us out on our social media pages. You can tag us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter with your pictures out enjoying the watershed. And finally, last but not least, a thank you to each of you for your help today is this quick little moment of Zen. This was taken in the Shenandoah Valley. Ah, super pretty. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, Brittany. I'd like to thank our audiences for joining us today as well. And thank you, Ashley, for, for fielding our questions. Have a great day and an even better weekend. And thank you for helping us save the bay. Yeah.